Siad referred repeatedly to the pledges laid down and enshrined in the first and second charters of the October Revolution. We made a promise to the nation, he said, that we would build a system within which the people themselves would have their say in the nation's affairs. Within a socialist system, this promise would be fulfilled as a matter of course. Our need, therefore, is to create just such a party to lead the nation towards its goal. president, the Minister of Education spoke of the great strides forward taken in his sphere since the revolution seven years before. He cited the first ever printing of books in the Somali language, the rapid growth of the school population, the national campaign against rural illiteracy. The vice president compared today's achievements by the various state departments with the demoralizing stagnation of the nine years between the gaining of national independence and the October revolution of 1969. The Minister of Commerce spoke of the enormous growth and investment in the country's agricultural and light engineering industry. The Minister of Information spoke of growing national and international awareness of and respect for the country and its present achievement. The nation's progress was obvious even though it still had far to go. But before we go further, we should ask, how had even this been possible and why was a Somali Socialist Party needed? For an answer, we must step back into history and trace the long struggle of the Somali people for an independent... <laughs> Armed with trinkets for trade and rifles to crush resistance, the Europeans descended upon Africa. But it was not easy. There was resistance. These centuries of piecemeal European exploitation led to a violent scramble for Africa. At Berlin in 1888, these quarrels were ended in formal partition treaties. In this, the Somali people were possibly least fortunate of all, as their country was divided four ways between Britain, France, Italy and Ethiopia. However, the Somalis did not submit themselves to dozens of dervishes perished to defend their homeland against the foreign intruders. Mohammed's many poems record both his victories and defeats. You are dead now, Caulfield. No longer of this world. A voyage without mercy was your portion when bound for hell you left for the beyond. If God so wills it, those in heaven will question you. When you see the companions of the faithful and the jewels of heaven, answer them how God has tried you. Say to them, from that day to this, the dervish assault has never weakened. Nor, as his poems show, did Sayyid Muhammad lack the courage to admit his defeats. Here, he complains at his countrymen's failure to join with the dervishes, warns them of the subtle tricks of colonialism, and concludes that his past victories and present setbacks are no more than the natural ups and downs of life itself. It suffer a serious setback. The years between 1922 and 1943 allowed the colonialists to settle down and rest. Now his prophecy of colonial evils came true. And once again, Somali heroes had to fan the flames of freedom in 1943. On the 15th of May, 1943, 13 youths formed the Somali Youth League. They struggled 17 years for freedom, both on the battlefield and in the political arena. Finally, on June the 26th, 1960, Britain withdrew from the Somali Protectorate. And on the day the Italians left, July the 1st, 1960, the Somali Republic was declared with 5 million people and a land area of 262,000 square miles. The longed-for day of freedom had dawned at last. But what would it bring? 
Political independence was won, but the colonial master still lingered in the wings. The dream of national unity was shattered by the intrigues of countless rival political parties. The country, with its 2,000-mile coastline, was left undeveloped. Neither the resources of the sea nor those of the land itself were put to use. While the politicians wrangled, exploiting public funds and foreign aid, the people awoke from their dream of independence to a reality closer to nightmare. And the politicians answer to their complaints, yet more political parties. And the people's lives continued as before. Unable to help themselves or change the course of events, they became poor, disheartened, apathetic. It was the nomads, the country's largest social group, who suffered worst. Their life in a cruel scrub environment had been harsh for centuries. To them, independence had promised a golden age of water and green pastures. Yet independence had come and brought them nothing. No change at all. Every political party boasted its own homespun insignia in lip service to a national commitment. But in the pitifully few schools of the country, the language and cultures were still foreign, English or Italian. Debate raged over when and how Somali language and culture could be introduced, yet it remained only debate. By now, Somalia had almost 90 political parties. At the March election of 1969, 74 of them put up 2,214 candidates to contest 123 parliamentary seats. Just how absurd this system was can be seen in the small town of Buleburde, where a total of 26 parties contested the 1969 election. Some 38,000 people voted, and of these, only 18,000 voted for successful candidates, leaving a 20,000 majority unrepresented distances, leaving their livestock and belongings behind to come and vote, often for men of their clan, men who offered them the earth, who bribed them, men of whose political ideals they knew little and understood less. In both the 64 and the 69 elections, one piece of outright deception to secure votes for the now corrupted SYL government and contradictory ballot system, an illiterate nomad girl like this, pressed to come in and vote, can easily be excused in her bewilderment for crossing out the entire voting paper with all its parties. Bah! Absurd. Many other ways were found to cheat the people of their votes. Ballot papers left blank by confused voters were collected after the poll and filled in to the government's favor by the SYL officials supervising the election. <laughs> then there were other tricks. Extra fingerprints, even fictitious names could be added to the government poll. Nobody would check. This then, again, was a setback to the nation's struggle for unity and coherent development. The country was swamped and stifled by the intrigues and self-interest of its rival political groupings. And so the results of the 1969 election. The SYL won 73 seats. 26 other parties won 50 seats between them, but of these, 49 joined the SYL after a month in the hope of obtaining ministerial posts. Today's vote is tomorrow's history. The headlines blazed. But what tomorrow? Self-interest was king now, and corruption and violence ruled as law and order broke down. Then came a day, October the 21st, when the armed forces arose in a bloodless revolution to take the nation's future into their hands. On that same day, they dissolved all political parties and issued the historic first charter of the Somali revolution, 